right, if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 17 this morning. Acts chapter 17. <clears throat> what a great time of worship. And I needed that. Did you need that? Yeah. Mm, so good. Let's all stand together. If you don't have a Bible, I want to encourage you to download our app. There uh, is a Bible that you can use and reference on our app. We're going to start in verse 1 and read down to verse 9. The Bible says, now, when they had passed through Am Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the what? <clears throat> from the scriptures. Explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, this Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews who were not persuaded, be, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob. Paul, Paul always had a, a riot <laughs> surrounding him, wherever he went. And gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people." But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out. This was what they said. They pull these Christians in. Uh, they're persecuting them. And this is really kind of our key uh, sentence today. These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king. Jesus, and by the way, there is, just in case you didn't know. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason, that is, they extorted him uh, and the rest, they let them go. Father, thank you so much for your word, and God, we, we want to be world changers. God, we want, we want to have an influence on the world around us. God, we don't want to just blend with the world. God, we want to be so firmly rooted in your word. God, we want such powerfully transformed lives that it is obvious and evident that we belong to you. And God, that your power flows in and through us. Father, in a time where there's just so much coming at us, so much information, so many people pulling our attention away from the scriptures. God, help us to be disciplined, to dial back into your word and to be Bible-focused, Bible-empowered, God. And, and as we do that, may we see the fruit, the evidence of the power of your word, not only in our lives and in our family, but God in our city and in our country. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can have a seat today. <clears throat> I love this quote. It's from A.W. Tozer. And if you've never uh, read a book by Tozer, I want to encourage you to do that. I think that this quote comes from Rut, Rot, or Revival. It's a great book. And you're either in one of those three categories. This, this is a a message for another time. You're, you're either in a rut spiritually, you're rotting spiritually, or there's a revival happening in your life. But he said this, it's up on the screen for you, I want the presence of God himself, or I don't want anything at all to do with religion. I want all that God has, or I don't want any. Isn't that good? Is, now, keep, just keep it up there. Is that you? Is that you? Is that your sentiment that you live with in your relationship with God? That you are, that you are uh, so fully experiencing the person of Christ? That you've been awakened to his beauty? I'm not just saying you've been awakened to your need for him. Absolute, absolutely, that has to happen. But you've been so awakened to how beautiful and how amazing he is that nothing that this world has to offer would ever satisfy you again, it's generated a hunger in your life for him. 
to be at that place where, where you can sincerely and honestly say that you are so in love with God and so dependent upon his presence that, that really that is all that you want in your life. You're not satisfied. You're not satisfied with just having uh, God occupy a part of your life uh, or to be a piece of your life. No, when you really experience the person of Christ, you want God to be all of your life. That's true. I hope it's true for you. The sad reality is that the church is sleeping in a culture that is Christian in name only. The church is sleeping today in a culture that is Christian in name only. Christians blend. Christians blend. Sometimes you can't even tell the difference between somebody who is a believer and somebody who is not a believer. Sometimes you can, in fact, be uh, developing some sort of relationship. Maybe it's a work relationship. Maybe, you know, you're engaged in the same hobby. Uh, maybe your kids have played on the same baseball team year after year. And that person that you've developed this relationship over the course of one year or five years or 10 years or 15 years, you know, you never even knew it, but they're a believer. It's been kind of concealed. You know, you can know a lot about people, whether it's via social media or maybe, like I said, developing a relationship with them. You know uh, details about their family. You know their political affiliation. You know what their favorite color is. You know what TV shows they like. You know their pick for the Super Bowl, <laughs> Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But you don't even know. They've never even expressed. They're not even really living a Christian life to the extent that you would even have an inkling. Or, you know, maybe, maybe that's not the case. Maybe, maybe it's, a, it's that they're a postscript Christian. You know all those things about their life. There is the, uh, the, the family details, the political affiliation, the favorite color, the TV shows, their pick for the Super Bowl. And it's, it's almost as if they add to that this little period, this little dot, this little postscript at the end. Oh, yeah, and by the way, I'm a Christian. Other than that statement, you would have never guessed because really there was no difference at all, nothing that distinguished them as a believer in Jesus Christ. I get concerned with today's Christianity because I think in some ways cultural acceptance seems to be the goal of the church. Cultural acceptance seems to be the goal of the church. The, the church is more concerned with being relevant to the world than being relevant to God. And if you and I live like that, we'll have no power. There will be no culture-changing power working through our lives. Listen, God intended his church not to blend into the world. He intended his church to change the world. You know that, right? That was... That was his plan. His plan wasn't that you and I would blend in or that we would fuse ourselves with the world around us. His intention and his plan, and look, it couldn't be any clearer than in the words that we read today. His intention, his plan was that we would be world changers, and uh, that is what today's message is called. I just want to draw your attention to that sentence once again in verse 6, chapter 17, where the Bible says this, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. I love that. You know, I can't think of a better compliment for the believer in Jesus Christ than that. You know, of course, we're going to talk about this in a minute. Um, of course, that when they said this, they said it uh, in a derogatory way. From their perspective, it was, a, it was not a positive statement. It was a negative statement. But if you're on the receiving end of that as a Christian, you're like, hey, I know I'm in the right place. I know I'm living my life the way that God desires me to live my life. I know that there's a difference. I know that my life is distinguished in some sense because even the unbelieving world around me can acknowledge it. Hey, don't ever forget that the gospel radically changes lives. Can we agree on that today? The gospel of Jesus Christ. How many of you have had your life radically changed by Jesus? Man, isn't he good? Isn't he good? If we could take the time and share each of our stories, uh, what an amazing thing it would be to hear about how God reached into the muck and the mire of our lives, 
uh, got a hold of us when we were at our worst and fully turned us around. You know, I think that when Paul was planting churches, he had this expectation. There was this anticipation that, you know, it's not that he was just going in and, and speaking some principles or ideas or philosophies or one of the many religions that were available for people to choose if they wanted to. No, I think that Paul understood that there was something greater than even nuclear power that he was bringing to a community or a city. He went into these communities. He found, like in this case, case in Thessalonica, by the way, you know, he was uh, directed by God. He and the missions team were, were directed by God to modern-day Greece, to ancient Macedonia. And it was a series of events that had led them there. And Paul, being strategic, he was a very strategic church planter, he went to each of the capital cities in the region. So he went to Philippi. He's in Thessalonica. Later on, we're going to see he goes to Berea and to Athens and to Corinth. Why? Because he wanted to plant churches in places that would have a regional influence. And so Paul rolls into Thessalonica, and the first thing he does is he goes to the synagogue, which, which was his pattern. It was his habit, you know. And it wasn't just that Paul went to a place that he wanted to be fam familiar with. Paul understood that the the gospel was the power of God unto salvation for all who believe, first for the Jew and then for the Greek. He understood that God had chosen Israel as a nation through Abraham, through Isaac, and through Jacob, that they were given the oracles of God. We're going to talk about that on Sunday night when we get to Romans chapter 9. That they were blessed and that they were given the oracles of God, that there were national promises that were given to them. But the greatest blessing of all for the Jewish people was that through them, God would bring his Messiah. God would bring his anointed one. God would bring the one that he had chosen to overturn the curse. Hey, we sang that today. He is the one who is worthy to break the seal and open the scroll. Right, John? I mean, the, the picture, <laughs> this isn't a study on Revelation, but the picture in Revelation chapter 4 and 5 is so amazing. Their God is on his throne, and he has in his hand a scroll, which is probably the title deed to the earth. And John is weeping because there's no one who's worthy to take the scroll from the hand of God. And the angel says, hey, there is one who is worthy, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the offspring of David, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God. And so... So the reality was that these Jews in these synagogues were waiting for Messiah. They were waiting for Messiah. And so Paul rolls in, and what does he do? He reasons with them from Scripture. You know, Paul didn't uh, just share his opinions. He didn't just share his ideas. He didn't just show videos of what other people were teaching. He opened the book. He read from the Word of God. He reasoned with them from the scriptures. And I just want to remind us that uh, that is where the power is at. The power is in the word of God. You guys know my opinions don't amount to a hill of beans. I've never said that phrase before in my life, but it just, it just came to my mind. I don't even know what that means. Somebody do a Google search on that later after the service. Where does hill of beans saying come from? You don't, you don't want to hear that. Like, when's the last time someone was powerfully impacted and their life was radically changed because you shared your opinion with them? Uh, never. That's never happened. But when you share the Word of God, when you share the Word of God, even if the person doesn't seem to be receiving what you're saying, the Word of God does not return void. It accomplishes its purpose. And so this is what he does. He rolls in and he goes to the scripture. By the way, he was able to prove that the Messiah had to suffer and the Messiah had to rise again. He was able to prove that from the Old Testament. Now, we're not going to get into a whole bunch of Old Testament verses, but I want to share a couple to, today with you that I think Paul probably uh, drew from. He probably drew their attention to these verses. Messiah had to suffer. Messiah had to suffer. Messiah had to die on behalf of humanity. Messiah had to take the cup of the wrath of God so that we could receive forgiveness. And this was what God had said all along. For instance, Isaiah chapter 53, 
Great chapter, by the way, if you've never read it, encourage you to spend some time in it. The prophet said this, 600 years before Christ was born, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him, speaking of Messiah, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. In the Old Testament, clearly Messiah had to suffer. But not only would Jesus the Messiah suffer on our behalf, not only would he be a substitutionary sacrifice, not only would he who did not deserve to die, die, but he was also risen from the dead. Psalm 1610 says this, speaking of this prophetically, uh, even further back from the mouth of David, so about a thousand years before the resurrection of Christ, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Speaking of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, hey, the victory, he, he secured the victory not only through the crucifixion, but he rose again victoriously from the dead. I pray that you rejoice in that. So listen, Christianity is not just adding Jesus to your life, it is getting a whole new life in Christ. God never intended you to be a postscript Christian where it's like you have all of these aspects and elements of your life that you're focused on and then, hey, by the way, just thought I'd let you know that I'm also a Christian. No, when he changes you, when he touches you, he changes everything. He has come to transform your life. He has come to give you a new life, that you might be born again from above, that you might become a son or a daughter of the living God. One day when you're in heaven, he in fact is going to give you a new name, which will be inscribed on your resurrected body. Hey, let me just say to you, it's that type of person that changes the world. It's that type of Christian that changes the world. If you are a postscript Christian, you will never have an influence on the world that you're living in. If you are a, a Christian who has concealed your Christian identity, you're in the closet behind the door, no one would ever guess, I'm telling you, you're never going to have the influence that God desires you to have. People who understand, like A.W. Tozer did, that when God came to transform you, he came to completely transform you to the place where nothing else that this world has to offer will ever satisfy you. That's, that's when, when you live in that spot, that's when you become a world change, changer. Gospel transformed people changed the world, and this was their reputation, so the picture is this, right? All these people, they're, they're really disturbed that Christians now have come to their city, Thessalonica. They gather them together, and this is exactly what they say. Those people who have turned the world upside down, now they're here too. Man, they're in our city. I, I was thinking about this from their perspective, and you know they're nervous. They're nervous that Christians have come to their city they're a little disturbed. Why would they be disturbed? Why would they have this negative uh, impression of Christians? Why would it be that they would want to protect their customs and their traditions and their ways of living? Let me tell you why. Because everywhere gospel-transformed Christians went, customs, ways of living, and traditions changed. They had an impact. They had an impact. They weren't waiting for some political entity. They weren't waiting to have some advancement in technology. It was through the very lives that they were living. Look, these people, think about this with me. These people, these Christians, Paul and Luke and Silas and the rest, they had no political clout. They had no political clout. They had no, they had no uh, large following of people. There was no superstar among them that had the uh, collateral to, to leverage their identity or their celebrity status. 
You know, sometimes as Christians, I think we think, hey, if we could just get that person, or if we could get the backing of those people, or if we could affiliate ourselves and we have this view of this worldly power, and if we could just get this power, then we would be more influential. I just want you to think about this today. Those Christians had none of that. They had none of it. What did they have? What did they have? Jesus. Oh, half one. Yeah, yeah, Jesus. <laughs> they, had, they had the Lord. What else did they have? They had the Word of God. What else did they have? They had the power of God's Holy Spirit. They had the, the power of the gospel. Hey, is that enough? Is it enough? How many of you really want to see... Uh, spiritual impact in the city and the country and the world in which we live. How many of you? Oh, we just mentioned it. I'm just encouraging you today that you have all that you need. In Antioch, they were called little Christs. They, they were living their lives so evidently for the, the Lord that the unbelieving world around them, for the very first time, called them Christians. In Ephesus... The worship of the goddess Artemis was abandoned because of the influence of the Christians in that city. In Lystra, the worship of Zeus and Hermes was abandoned because of the influence of the Christians in that city. Silversmiths that were making idols out of silver went out of business because of the influence of the Christians living in those cities. Slaves that were telling fortunes and, and providing a revenue stream for slave owners were set free, and those revenue streams dried up because of the witness of Christians. Listen, Christianity has changed cultures. Christianity played a role in the ending of practices such as human sacrifice and infanticide and polygamy. It affected the status of women by con condemning marital infidelity, divorce, incest, and abortion. In, a, in Rome, it was the Christians and the Christian influence that in ended the branding of criminals and crucifixion. And in India, it was the Christian influence that brought to an end the practice of suti. And so I'm just saying to you today that when Christians really do live out the biblical principles of the word of God, the culture around them is affected. Principles like family matters and the value of a wife and the value of a husband, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. The sanctity of human life, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Sexual fidelity, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 to 10. Look, when you and I are focused... When you and I are not distracted by adding something to our Christianity, but we're really living out the power of God's word and the power of the gospel, that is when culture around us changes. And I do just want to remind you again, these individuals had no capital. They had no political capital. They had no personal power. All of these things in the early church, as God would change the known world, was being done through people like you and me. Do you believe that today? Do you believe God can use your life like that? Are you available? Is your life available to God to be used in such a way? Look, I, I think today, and this is kind of the core of the message, I think one of the greatest threats to the power of of the Christian witness is syncretism. One of the greatest threats to the power of the Christian witness is syncretism. Syncretism is the fusion of Christianity with other beliefs and practices, often other religions. Let me read that again. It's the fusion of Christianity with other beliefs and practices, often other religions. Now, when I say syncretism, or I talk about that idea um, it's easy for us to, to see that in something like Haitian voodoo or Santeria in Cuba, where if you go there with me on a mission trip, you will see that they have combined Roman Catholicism with West African witchcraft. It's, it's 
it's that they're fused together, that syncretism. These two things are fused together, and it's, it's obvious, it's evident. It's Christianity plus something else. I think it's more subtle in our culture. I think syncretism is more subtle in our culture. It's harder to see when we're living Christianity plus lives. But it happens. It happens to the believer when we get to the place where we're seeking our life guidance from non-believers, when maybe we're adopting the principles of the world to make decisions in our life instead of going back to the Word of God. Some Christians today consulting horoscopes, looking to the stars to discover what it is that might be coming to them in their future. I think about the emphasis on nationalism, like Roman Catholicism in the 4th century, where we're combining the state and Christianity. I think about the power of positive thinking, and especially in the 80s, that, as that new ageism idea has such an impact on Christian life, and it diminished the power of the gospel. I think about the American dream. And how some people would say, well, the American dream is the will of God for your life, which leads us to the whole prosperity gospel, which is, in fact, a different gospel. It is not the real gospel. Look, any time we start to add things to our Christianity, we not only minimize the power of the gospel working through our lives, but we ourselves can be swept away and distracted from the power of God's word. Look, why, why am I sharing this today? Because maybe more than ever in my Christian life, I see that we as believers are overloaded with ideas and opinions that are daily funneled into our minds every single day. I don't know about you guys, but are you a little overwhelmed with that? Are you a little, like, tired of it? I was talking to somebody the other day, and they're like, you know, I took a two-week break from the news and it changed my life. It changed my life. Now, listen, don't get me wrong, okay? I'm not, I'm saying, hey, be careful of syncretism, but I'm not advocating obscurantism. And obscurantism is the idea where, hey, we're just going to bury our heads in the sand and act like, hey, we don't know what's going on. It doesn't matter anyway. I'm not saying that. I'm for sure not saying that. But you know there is, there is such an overload of information right now. And people share it on their social media. They text you videos. Oh, you got to listen to this person. you got to listen to this guy's idea. This is really the way I think that we ought to be doing things. And pretty soon you find yourself being swept away. You find yourself being swept away. It is such a subtle way for the enemy to minimize the power of the gospel. Listen, because we start focusing on things that are in addition to Christianity. Pretty soon I find myself focused on the American dream, and that's what I'm communicating to other people. Or maybe I find myself focused on the power of positive thinking. Or maybe I'm so swept up in worldly guidance and counsel, I'm not even advocating the Word of God anymore. Or maybe the issue of politics has so dominated my life that that the gospel and the place of the gospel and the Word of God has been diminished almost to nothing. I'm just saying this to to you today as your pastor. Be careful. Be wise. Step back, all right? Step back and step into, step back into the Word of God. I said this a couple of weeks ago. Christians shouldn't follow a culture that is not following God. Christians shouldn't follow a culture that is not following God. Listen, because Christians are culture creators, not culture emulators. Did you know that? Christians are culture creators, not culture emulators. We've not been called just to blend or to fuse into this world. There is a brand new thing that God is seeking to bring to our world through our lives. And if we're fusing with all sorts of other things in this world, we are going to look just like the world. This this phrase has been on my mind for the last two weeks. I think that as a whole, this is going to sound like a very broad generalization, but 
I think as a whole, we have lost the art of listening to God. I think as a whole, we have lost the art of listening to God. Why do I need to listen to God? You know, I can pop on a podcast. Why do I need to listen to God? I can tune in to my favorite pastor. Why do I need to listen to God? Because I can, I can spend some time hearing my favorite political pundit. I'm not saying that those voices have no value. I am saying that we, in, in our culture right now, we are almost irresistibly drawn to them to the place, to the place where we have lost the art of listening to God. Hey, so what that this pastor or this pundit or this podcaster said this, that, or the other. What is God saying? What is God saying to you? What is God speaking to your life? What is the last thing that the Spirit of God, through the power of personal revelation, has caused you to see? And you, you guys know that the devil is a deceiver. He will seek to overwhelm you with so information that you can't even find if you're distracted, you can't even find the voice of God anymore until you separate yourself out, until you dial things down, until you devote your full attention to the Lord. You know sometimes when that happens, sometimes when we get swept away, I've shared this with you before, uh, you know, years ago, this was like, I don't even want to tell you how many decades ago it was because I'm getting really old, but a long time ago, first trip to Hawaii, I was out in front of the hotel, I got a raft, I got on the raft, I fell asleep on the raft, and then I woke up like, it felt like two miles from the shore, all right? And all I heard in my mind was, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> that's, that's all I heard. And I'm like, <laughs> nobody cared enough to like come out and rescue me. Um, I, had to, I had to get all the way back, but... But man, there was, there was an epiphany, there was an awakening, there was a like, oh my gosh moment, right? It was, how could I have drifted? How could I have drifted this far? Well, I drifted because I was asleep and because it was subtle. It was just beautiful. The waves were mm, so nice. The sun was shining, you know? I mean, and it was nap time. But... <laughs> But it was that subtle. It wasn't until I woke up that I realized and recognized how far, how far away I was from shore. Dude, you don't want to know. <laughs> like in eternity, I'm telling you, it was bad. It was so bad I died. <laughs> I didn't die. Here I am. Spiritually, the same thing can happen to us. Spiritually, the same thing can happen to us. Look, we're like the frog boiling in the pot. We, we don't even realize it. We're inundated with all this stuff, and because we're in it, it's influencing us, and we don't even realize or recognize how much it's influencing us to the, to the point where we might be even engaging in behavior that is biblically wrong, but we are so confused, we've justified it. We've justified it. Easy for us, easy for us to criticize and to gossip and to backbite and, and to have little communities that were developed where, where we're creating a little anti-culture. And we have drifted so far that we can't even see that anymore. I'm saying to you, brothers and sisters, shut the noise off. Shut it off and get back to God. And get back to God. Look, because the impact, because the impact I want to have in this world is for the gospel. It's for the gospel. I'm not looking, this is going to uh, fry some of you right now, but it's, you know, I'll talk with you about it later. I'm not looking to advance my political party. I'm looking to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ and to see souls one, period. And look, that's the heart of this ministry. It's always been the heart of this ministry. The pastoral team here for three decades has had to deal with stuff that's gone down. And what do we do? We stay focused on the Word of God and the Great Commission. 
Sometimes we find ourselves wanting to share popular videos because people, we think people need to listen to, to them. I want to encourage you, share scriptures so people can meditate on them. Share scriptures. Share scriptures. Hey, so Paul, right, he, he plants in Thessalonica. He goes to Berea, and at the, next, at the next place, the next synagogue where he's preaching the gospel, this is what they do. He goes in, he reasons from the scripture. The Bible says that they... They, they listened and they checked what Paul said with the word of God. They looked to the word of God themselves to make sure that what it was that Paul was saying was actually true. They verified. They went to the source. Look, be a Berean. Be a Berean. Have a lifestyle that is committed to the word of God and not just knowing it, but living it out. Is your life turning the world upside down for God? Is your life turning the world upside down? I pause there because, because, you know, we can turn the world all crazy with all sorts of stuff, but I'm not talking about other stuff. I'm talking about for God. Is your life turning the world upside down for God? Jeremiah 15, 19. Jeremiah, obviously, you know, was in a very difficult situation, difficult religious culture that he was in. He was speaking a message that was not popular with anybody because Israel had drifted so far from God. They couldn't even see it, even when the prophet came to preach and declare it. And so in the midst of that very corrupt generation that had so confused religiosity with Judaism, God said, this to him, you must influence them, do not let them influence you. You must influence them, do not let them influence you. You guys know the difference between a the thermostat and a the thermometer? Do you? Let's show that picture up there, just in case you don't. Just in case you don't, the one on the left is a thermostat, the one on the right is a thermometer. One changes the temperature, one reads the temperature. The temperature. Are you a thermostat or are you a thermometer? Are you simply a reflection of what's happening in the culture? Do people just look at your life and get a reading on the reality of the culture because really you're so fused with the world around you that there's no difference between you and the unbeliever? Or are you an influencer? Are you an influencer? Is your life changing the atmosphere? Is there an impact that you are having on the culture around you because you are living a gospel-transformed life? The decision is before us today, and the course that God has given to us is a tricky one to navigate. Let's get back to the scriptures. Let's live gospel transformed lives and let's believe that through that God is going to change our city our nation and the world amen, amen. all right God so thankful today so thankful we cannot go wrong we cannot go wrong focusing on your word God we we cannot go wrong, devoting our whole lives to you and to your son and to the great commission. And Father, we pray that, that you would help us to not drift. We pray that we would not be the distracted generation. God, we pray that we would not be so caught up in, in so many other things that we neglect the most important thing. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit, there's only one Holy Spirit. No pastor is the Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you would speak to us. You would be the one. Give us the revelation that we need. God, open up our eyes. Father, overcome the defensiveness within our own hearts. And, and God, our determination to justify our positions. God, renew us. Renew us. God, renew that simple childlike faith. God, I pray that we would be like new wineskins, ready. 
God, ready for that new wine, that new work of your spirit. Father, we want to be an influence for your gospel. We know the need is maybe greater now than ever. Help us to see the the wiles of our adversary. Help us to walk circumspectly with wisdom. And Father, we pray that just from this time in your word, you would bring amazing fruit. God, amazing fruit for your glory. Today, as our eyes are closed, as we're just ending this time in the word, maybe your life is the one that needs change today. You know, you've tried many things to produce change. Maybe you've listened to gurus or maybe you've tried to assert your own willpower and strength, but you find yourself back at that same point again, just going in a circle. Today, I want to tell you there's one who can truly transform and change your life. There's one who paid the price for you to experience the power of Almighty God. There's one who suffered in your place so that you could know the forgiveness of sins and the healing of your heart, so that you could be renewed and given the gift of everlasting life. There's only one who is the rescuer and the deliverer, and that is Jesus. He is the Christ, the Messiah. He is the Son of the living God. And today, he's brought you here, or he's tuned you in online to reveal himself to you so that you can come by faith just as you are, to put your trust and faith in him to be transformed and changed forever. He can do that. He can make that change in your life that you so desperately need. Will you put your trust and faith in him today? There is one way to God. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Today, you can have that relationship with the Father through faith in the Son. This morning, if this is you, I want to pray for you. There's a step of faith for you to take. It's the most important step of faith you'll ever take. Coming to Jesus and acknowledging that you've sinned against God and that you're trusting in Him his sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. Today, if this is you, I want to pray for you right where you're sitting. Would you raise your hand this morning? You'd say, Pastor, I need, I need him in my life. God bless you right here in the front. I see your hand over here on my right. Awesome. Anybody else? Stretch your hand up high. He's got a plan for you today. He wants to do a work in your life today, right now. God bless you. Thank you so much on my left. It's present to help you. It's not weakness to acknowledge that you need God's help. Stretch your hand up if you need the help of God today. Thank you. Over here on my right. It's awesome. I see your hand here. In the center row. Back here on my left. I see your hand over here on my left. You can put your hands down today if you're a Christian and, and listen honestly, sincerely. There's, there's no judgment here. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. But the truth is you've been drifting. You've been swept up in something, whatever it might be. And, and you know today you need to come back to him. You need to come back to him. Now is the time to do that. I want to pray for you if this is you. Would you raise your hand? This morning, just stretch your hand up high, acknowledge, Pastor, you know what? I need to get back to what matters most. Thank you here in the front, over here, back on my right, right here in the center, over here on my left. Thank you so much, right here in the front. He loves us. This is, this is the heart of God, to draw us close to him. Anybody else? You can put your hands down. Father, thank you. God, just grateful today for each of these. 
Grateful, God, that you speak to us. Thankful, Father, that your word is powerful, that your spirit is present. We ask for each of these, God, as they do step forward in faith and and receive that fresh new beginning that you have, that, God, you would, as you always do, exceed their expectations. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's all stand today. Um, What we're going to do now, if you raise your hand today to either uh, receive Christ for the very first time, or maybe, you know, you raise your hand because there's been some drifting in your life and you need that point of rededication. This is what we're going to do. I want to lead you in a prayer because there's only one that stands between you and God. That's Jesus Christ. And today, God wants to hear your voice. God wants to hear your heart. You need to pray to him. So if you raise your hand today, I want to lead you in a very, very simple prayer. Pastor Tony is going to lead us in a song of worship. And um, if you did raise your hand, I want to invite you to come down to the front here so I can lead you in this prayer. Very simple step of faith for you to take this morning, but God has touched you. So as Tony leads us, if you raise your hand, either to give your life to Christ for the first time or you're recommitting your life, come on down to the front. Let me lead you in prayer. I God's doing today. I'm going to lead these in prayer. If there's anybody else, look, if God's tugging on your heart right now, and I say that and you know, you know who you are. It's awesome. Thank you so much. Hey, God is speaking to you today. God has spoken to you today. You know, take this step of faith. Don't leave with the regret today. Receive what it is that God has for you. You know, you can stay in your seat and and think, hey, well, God will awesome, man. Thank you. You can say, hey, God, God, Pastor, God can bless me. God can bless me right where I'm at. And I, that's true. That's true. So much better if you just come forward today, all right? Say yes to him. Tony's going to continue to lead us. Make your way to the front. Let me lead you in prayer today. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling and bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling oh come to the altar the Father's Arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Just come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought. loves you. And I want to encourage you as we pray, just pray by faith. Pray believing that God hears you as he says he does in your word. 
in his words, excuse me, and that he's going to bless you. He'll be faithful to bless you as you seek his face. So I want to encourage you to pray this prayer out loud after me. God, thank you for speaking to me. God, thank you for Jesus, your son. Today I believe that he died for me and that he rose again. I'm turning to him in faith. I'm choosing to follow him all the days of my life. God, bring to me the change that I need. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Awesome. So great. Hey, before you guys go back to your seat, over on my right, your left, is Pastor Brandon. I'm going to walk over to Pastor Brandon. We have a Bible for you. We want to pray for you. So if you followed me in prayer, let's walk together. The rest of you, God bless you. Have a great week.